Oh my god, the guy who comments on everything that I post, do a Vinyl Monday on Frank Zappa, same wording every single time. That guy is gonna have a field day with this stuff. Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records. This is Double Album December Part 2. Oh, things are gonna get a little weird this week. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is usually the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. But today is Friday, this is December, which means it's week two of Double Album December. Last week was part one, that was London Calling by The Clash. If you need to catch up, if 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry, I also do one minute versions of all of my videos here on my channel, over on my Instagram, as well as on TikTok. You people, or rather one of you in particular, bullied me into this one by leaving the same comment, same wording and everything, do a Vinyl Monday on Frank Zappa, on every post I made for months. I appreciate the dedication. I love a good copy pasta meme and it just goes to show if you yell at me enough, I will eventually get to something. Here it is, part two of Double Album December. Freak out by the mothers of invention. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you wanna play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what the next album is gonna be. I host polls over there, make announcements. You can find all that on my channel. All right, this jacket's getting noisy, so let's take the plastic off. So my copy is from 1966. It's lived in, pre-loved condition as I'd say, but man is this still a treasure. This was sent to my P.O. box in the very first batch of albums I ever received there. You saw that in my very first vinyl collection update. I say the viewers make this series go round, whether it's your insights, your memories from experiencing this stuff in real life, requests, recommendations, and generous gifts to the channel. The Freak Out cover art was photographed by Ray Leong and designed by Jack Anesh. Jack worked for MGM and its subsidiaries like Verve. He's known for these high contrast, acid bright, blown out album covers. See this one he did for Duke Ellington in 67 and this one for Buddy Rich. The back cover features a note from Susie Cream Cheese and this is what it says. These mothers is crazy. You can tell by their clothes. One guy wears beads and they all smell bad. We were gonna get them for a dance after the basketball game, but my best pal warned me you can never tell how many will show up. Sometimes the guy in the fur coat doesn't show up, and sometimes he does show up, only he brings a bunch of crazy people with him, and they dance all over the place. None of the kids at my school like these mothers, especially since my teacher told us what the words to their songs meant. Sincerely forever, Susie Cream Cheese, Salt Lake City, Utah. Opening up the gatefold, we have what looks like a teen magazine with the freakout blur backwards, credits, biographical trivia, and more. On the original runs, you could mail in for a map of the Sunset Strip with all the landmarks like the world-famous Whiskey A Go Go. On Freak Out, we have the original lineup of the Mothers of Invention. Ray Collins on co-lead vocals, tambourine, harmonica, sound effects, cymbals, and finger cymbals, and bobby pin and tweezers. Elliot Ingber on guitar, quote, with clear white light, whatever that means. Roy Estrada on bass, guitaron, and soprano vocals. Jimmy Carl Black on drums slash various percussion, quote, also sings in some foreign language. I am loving these credits so far. And of course, our late great band leader on vocals and guitar, the real life version of the Power Within guy from SpongeBob. The Power Within. The Power Within. The power within. 
Frank Zappa. Special guests include the Wrecking Crew, credited here as part of the Mother's Auxiliary, including Carol Kay on 12-string guitar, Gene Estes on percussion, and Dr. John on piano. We have Paul Butterfield on backing vocals, Kim Fowley on hypophone, and Jeannie Vaswar as the voice of Susie Cream Cheese. Susie was voiced by a few different women throughout the Zappa discography. Jeannie was the original. Freak Out was produced by Tom Wilson. Roll a freaky transition. Susie? Yes. Susie Cream Cheese? Yes. Honey, what's got into ya? So the Soul Giants guitarists just quit. Right now, they're the house band of the Broadside in Pomona, California, playing covers of R&B tunes and blues standards. Enter Frank Zappa. Now, if you can believe it, before music, Frank was in advertising, so he had a brain for business. Frank knew Ray Collins a while before this, and Ray asks Frank to fill in. Frank and his business brain knew that the Soul Giants were a great group of guys, talented musicians, but they could be something really special if they wrote their own material. Something a little... weirder. Not quite pop, but not quite avant-garde. Something that would eventually become known in the LA scene as freak music. Dave Coronado, the soul giant sax player, was like, what the f is this sh I'm not playing this sh Goodbye. I know Frank would disapprove of the R-swear censor joke. He was very much against censorship, but alas, I must, or the YouTube gods will smite me. In early 65, Frank gets the guys in with a manager, Herb Cohen. This guy would become one of the heavyweights of the Laurel Canyon scene, eventually managing Tom Waits and Linda Ronstadt. On Mother's Day 1965, the Soul Giants renamed themselves to The Mothers. More on this name change later. The newly christened Mothers made their name in the underground music scene of LA, but it wasn't easygoing. They made next to no money in their first couple years because they were playing, quote, grossly unpopular music. In order to pay the bills, they needed a gimmick. So what do they do? They start heckling the audience before the audience can heckle them. And son of a bitch, it worked. People came not so much for the music, but for the show. In early 66, producer Tom Wilson ventures out from his home base in New York City to LA. Before this, Tom was a producer at Columbia, most notably for Bob freaking Dylan. The back half of Free Wheelin', the times they are changing another side, bringing it all back home and like a rolling stone, all produced by Tom. At the same time, he produced Simon and Garfunkel's Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., along with its belated breakout hit, The Sound of Silence. In a pretty controversial move, Tom dubbed in electric instruments and re-released the song to capitalize on the original's success without Simon or Garfunkel's knowledge or permission. Gotta love record labels, am I right? After both Dylan and S&G jump ship to Bob Johnston, Tom jump ship from Columbia to another New York City-based label, Verve Records. On this fateful LA trip, on recommendation from Herb, Tom stops by the Whiskey A Go Go to catch a mother's gig. He only catches one song, though, Trouble Every Day. Folksy protests slash social commentary songs were really big back then, plus there was a folk pop boom coming out of the Laurel Canyon scene thanks to the birds. At the same time, Electra is having great success with the Paul Butterfield Blues Band. In Tom's mind, from the very little that he's seen, the mothers are the perfect combination of white boy blues, and socially conscious folk pop. After just this one song, right, just one song, 
Tom calls up Verve and says he wants to sign the mothers, and they're signed pretty much on the spot, on Tom's assumption that they were a white boy blues band. And Herb's neglect to inform him otherwise, I guess he just wanted to watch the world burn. So what exactly is freak music? As we get into 68 and 69, the line between this and outsider music gets a little blurry, thanks to who else? Frank Zappa. So here's a breakdown of what the Mothers circa 66 brand of freak music is. To begin with, Freak Out is an early concept album. This isn't some pet sound situation where it's an accidental concept album. No, Frank set out to do this. This was how he wrote. Each track revolves around similar themes. Celebrity, consumerism, American pop music, and the teen culture of the day. Or more specifically, mocking this culture du jour. Satire. The theme of American pop music is represented sonically, too. We have blues-based tunes, doo-wop songs, folk pop, and psych. But then you have jazz avant-garde, musique concrète entering the fold. This is where things get interesting. Frank was sitting on the freak-out material for a while. He just needed the right band and the resources to do it. And he stumbled on just that with The Mothers, Verve, and Tom Wilson. Freak Out was recorded in a whirlwind four days, March 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th at TTG Studios in LA. This studio was owned by engineer Ami Hanadi. I'm not kidding when I say this is one of the most insane production timelines I've ever heard of. Not so much for the time frame, but for the sh** that happened during it. On day one, the mothers cut two tracks, Anyway the Wind Blows, about Frank's impending divorce from his first wife Kay, and who are the brain police? After a couple takes of brain police, Tom is pale in the face. The mothers turned out to be, in fact, not at all a white boy blues band, and now Tom had to call Verve and inform them of his little oopsie. However, according to Frank, Tom, quote, was so impressed he got on the phone and called New York. As a result, I got a more or less unlimited budget to do this monstrosity. Is it not so so funny that Frank Zappa himself called this thing a monstrosity. And he wasn't exactly kidding when he said unlimited. I mean, starting budget was about 5k, so 47 grand in today's money? Sheesh already. Buckle up, Buttercup. Modern day estimates have the mothers blowing somewhere around 30 grand on Freak Out. That would be nearly 285 thousand dollars in today's money what the f how did a rookie band get this kind of budget well it's because tom was saying yes to everything for example frank approached him at the end of day two saying I would like to rent $500 worth of percussion equipment for a session that starts at midnight on Friday, that's about $4,700 today, and I want to bring all the freaks from Sunset Boulevard into the studio. And Tom just said yes? That song became Cream Cheese, a ballad in two tableaus. I'm honestly pretty impressed Tom put his ass on the line to make this thing happen. Why did he do it? Well, he is, he is tripping, tripping on, on acid, acid at the, at the control, control panel. panel. Because of course he was. You know, now that I think of it, Tom might have been pale on day one just because he was having a bad trip. On day two, Frank descends into an epic writing spell. He comes up with pretty much all the orchestral arrangements for the entire album, and this isn't stuff for some eight-piece ensemble, okay? According to Frank and Hit Parader magazine, this was the ideal ensemble for a mother's album. I'm just going to read this directly from my notes because you'll see why. Two piccolos, two flutes, two bass flutes, two oboes, an English horn, three bassoons, a contrabassoon, four clarinets with the fourth player doubling up on alto clarinet, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, and bass saxophones, four trumpets, four French horns, three trombones, and a partridge in a pear tree, one brass trombone, one tuba, one contrabass tuba, two harps, two pianos, electric pianos, Piano, like a Vox Continental or a Mellotron or something. Electric harpsichord, electric clavichord, Hammond organ. Okay, so I guess the 
electric piano would be something different. I don't know, he didn't specify. Uh, Celeste and piano bass. 10 first violins, 10 second violins, eight violas, six cellos, four string basses, four percussionists playing 12 timpanies. Chimes, gongs, field drums, bass drums, snare drums, wood blocks, lion's roar, I, vibes, xylophone, and marimba. Three electric guitars, one electric 12 string guitar, bass guitar, and two drummers at sets, plus vocalists who play tambourines. And I won't be happy until I have it. End quote. So, Verve compromises with a 22 piece orchestra in the form of the Wrecking Crew. Man, between this, the ill fated smile sessions, and the Forever Changes debacle, Carol Kay sure has seen some shit. Days three and four were just spent slamming out this bona fide insanity. Where Verve finally put their foot down was Cream Cheese, now retitled to the return of Monster Magnet. <laughs> Once MGM realized exactly what their subsidiary had blown this much money on, they slammed on the brakes. Monster Magnet was never truly finished. What we hear on the album is only part of the behemoth we were supposed to get. MGM denied the request for more studio time, that which would have been used for the overdub. So that's why we have a ballet in two tableaus as opposed to God knows what. The track listing of... Freak Out goes as follows. Oh, can you tell I'm having so much fun with this right now? Okay, opening up disc one, we have Hungry Freak's Daddy, followed by I Ain't Got No Heart. Then, Who Are the Brain Police? Next, Go Cry on Somebody Else's Shoulder, followed by Motherly Love, and side one ends with How Could I Be Such a Fool. Opening up side two, we have Wowie Zowie. Then You Didn't Try to Call Me. Next, Any Way the Wind Blows. Then I'm Not Satisfied. And disc one ends with You're Probably Wondering Why I'm Here. Opening up disc two, we have Trouble Every Day. And closing out, we have Help I'm a Rock, including It Can't Happen Here. And on side four, closing out the album, we have The Return of Monster Magnet. The two tableaus in question being Ritual Dance of the Child Killers and Noah's Pretty, in parentheses, no commercial potential. Freak Out was released June 27th, 1966 to a resounding, huh? Yeah, most people had no idea what the hell to make of this. Turns out this thing had no commercial potential. Who would have thought? The general public reacted with confusion, shock, disgust, fear, even anger. But where the general public either turned up their noses or ran away screaming, help, help! Freak Out immediately found a happy home with the people who made it possible, the freaks on the West Coast. By word of mouth, Freak Out became one of the cult classic albums of the 60s. It's Trout Mask Replica, Philosophy of the World, and this. There was some trouble marketing this thing. For one, what genre do you even classify it as? Where do you put it in your store? Before we even get there, there were problems surrounding the title and the band name. Freak Out is, of course, slang for a bad acid trip. I've used it plenty of times on this channel. If The Doors couldn't say, girl, we couldn't get much higher on Ed Sullivan, then a blatant reference to the Sid isn't going very far. And the band name. They were originally just the mothers, but this would be perceived as being short for the motherfuckers. So they added of invention to make it slightly more palatable. <laughs> Inevitably, they were just shortened to the mothers anyway. I've done it in this video. And things got even worse in 67 and 68 with the rise of the other mothers. You know, the motherfuckers. So the mothers just did all of that of invention nonsense for nothing. This was one of the first double albums in rock and roll history. Only Dylan beat Zappa to it. This is interesting, okay? In Europe, where 
Freak Out was released as a single album, it was a hit. And that's why the mothers needed a Susie Cream Cheese to go on tour with them, because they all saw the back cover, read the letter, and just assumed Susie was real. I can't help but feel like this was the release that rewrote Verve's reputation from a jazz label, right? This was the stuff they were releasing before Frank Zappa, to the hot new label the edgy cool band signed with, like... The Velvet Underground. Tom Wilson also worked on that record and had a similarly laissez-faire attitude to The Velvet's similarly bonkers sessions. Though their relationship was not all sunshine and roses, Zappa postured Verve to be one of the first alternative music labels. The other one was Electra with The Doors, though that wouldn't happen for another six months. Uh, Freak Out is wildly influential, the reaches of which we'll dig into a little more in the next chapter. Freak Out inspired everyone from Can to The Grateful Dead to Weird Al. It inspired a whole magazine called Freak Out. And yes, it inspired... Paul McCartney. He cited Freak Out as instrumental to the making of Sgt. Pepper's. Frank caught wind of this hated it, and wrote We're Only In It For The Money in response, with perhaps the greatest parody cover in all of rock and roll history. So, what do I think of Freak Out? Going in. What the fuck? Number one. This is the weirdest record I've covered so far. Nothing has made me stew quite as befuddled, damn near stumped, as Freak Out. Number two, this is the densest record I've covered so far. Listening to this several times over was not easy for me to do. There's a lot going on here. It'd be a hell of a lot to parse through as a single album, and there's two whole discs of this sh And number three, this is the hardest record I've ever had to write about, mostly because I know I'll be missing a lot of stuff here. I'm not a musician, so I'm gonna miss the technical stuff. Now that I got those three big things out of the way, going in. As long as I've been a music fan, specifically of the 60s and 70s, I was aware of Frank Zappa. I knew he was massively influential, revered deeply by people who really know their sh about the 60s, uh, but I've been intimidated to get into his catalog. Mostly because A, I know it's huge, and B, there are some insufferable pricks in that fan base. So I dipped my toe into the ZECU via other projects he had a hand in. You know, Captain Beefheart, Alice Cooper's early days, still cannot believe I found pretties for you at a thrift store for $20. And namely, a little band called the GTOs. They were a troop of groupies which Zappa lumped together to form a girl group. They sang, danced, wrote songs, and performed skits. I put a lot of that in air quotations because uh, the GTOs were a lot more performance art than music. None of these girls could sing a note. They made one record, Permanent Damage, which I would sell my soul to have a copy of. I'm in love with the Ooh Ooh Man is unironically a banger. So I really got to know Frank and his merry band of freaks through Pamela DeBar, a former GTO and nanny for Frank's kids. I'd heard for a while that either this or Apostrophe are the Gateway Zappa albums. I was considering Freak Out for a distant future episode, but you can thank the guy who came up with the double album December concept and Zappa guy for expediting the process. Like I mentioned before, this was not just a challenge to my taste, but to the way I listen to music for these videos. This is not an album you can just idly listen to. You have to actively listen to this music to absorb it. I don't know how I should engage with this thing. I feel like every way I do it is wrong. I feel ashamed to admit that I 
earnestly love the more accessible moments here. I love the almost pop songs. Any Way the Wind Blows was the first Zappa extended cinematic universe song I ever heard. It was probably through Miss Pamela's book, if I had to guess. Wind Blows is the kookier end of whatever was in the water in Laurel Canyon in the 60s. It's got the delightfully mid-60s tambourine and jangly guitars. Then you throw in the vibraphone and it's so original to the mothers. Not to mention this song is hilarious. It's the fuck you, Kay. I'm leaving you for Gale song. I am shocked this was never a single. It might have been a moderate radio hit, but I feel like I'm doing Freak Out wrong if I really enjoy these pop songs, so then I move on to the parody stuff. Hungry Freak's Daddy is so silly and fun. From the spoof of the satisfaction riff to the cutesy xylophone, the sickly kazoo, an unreasonably good guitar solo. Like, I forget sometimes that Zappa is hailed as one of the greatest greatest guitarists of all time. And if you don't shimmy and shake your whole body to Hungry Freaks Daddy, we are not the same. And I Ain't Got No Heart is wild, man. The first time I heard that distinctly cream vocal line, if you don't believe me, listen to this and dance the night away back to back, and thought, oh, haha, this must be a cream parody. But no. Disraeli gears wouldn't come out for another year and a half. And there's some eerily strange days era doors stuff happening on this, and the doors were barely a band in the spring of 66, and Brain Belize does a Sabbath thing. Sabbath themselves have cited Zappa as an influence, so I know Tony pulled from Brain Police for Iron Man. I knew Freak Out was wildly ahead of its time, but I didn't, like, no. Go cry on somebody else's shoulder is hilarious. Just trivial teenage bullshit. Rushing out the line, that's why I had to get my khakis pressed, sent me into orbit. I had my car reupholstered. I had my hair processed. I had a nice pompadour job on it. But through the backing vocals and the composition, you can tell there's a genuine appreciation for doo-wop in there. The pop stuff was used as a time capsule for this very special place, the Sunset Strip in the 60s. What a wild place that was. You could walk around with your hair boofed out to here and big brown shoes on, or wearing all antique robes and no shoes, and no one cared. Motherly Love and Wowie Zowie are the most colloquially Sunset Strip songs here. You know, the We Love Groupies songs. Wowie Zowie is quite fluffy. Both aren't exactly timeless, but Wowie is charming in a goofy way. On the other hand, you have trouble every day. I know a lot of sources say this song is about the Watts riots, but take a look at these lyrics. I watched that rotten box until my head began to hurt from checking out the way the newsmen say they get the dirt before the guys on channel so-and-so. It's a critique of the news cycle, very relevant for our 24-hour news cycle today. But liking that earnest stuff still feels lame, so then I move on to the experimental stuff. Some moments are just so goofy and strange that you have to laugh, like the Mario Kart 64 ass Bowser sound at the end of I Ain't Got No Heart, or a line that's just total stream of consciousness. Right when you think you know where Freak Out is going, it throws a curveball at you. The second disc is where things get really deranged. You have trouble every day to sort of lull you into a false sense of security. And then comes Help I'm a Rock and Monster Magnet. Though I may not fully get it or like it the way I honestly like Revolution 9, yes, I'm one of those crazy people, I respect and appreciate Monster Magnet, even if it goes on just a smidge too long. This might have been the first sound collage. It is full tilt insanity with synths, dissonance, deep consciousness murmurs, primal indulgences, babbling. Uh, it's like the demented medley of everything we've heard thus far. And Kendrick Lamar? Like, is that 
on to Pimp a Butterfly, I think the song You, is that supposed to be a reference to this? Oh, Monster Magnet is a love letter to the freaks of LA. The one thing keeping me afloat through this 12 minute trip is the drumming. It's really, really good psych rock drumming amongst this madness. But I have to say, I'm kind of glad that Frank didn't get what he wanted with Monster Magnet. Any more stuff, and we would have really gone off the deep end. It's just enough psychedelic freak out for me. Maybe freak out's greatest asset, besides the sick minds behind the music, was Tom Wilson. Aside from cobbling something vaguely commercial, together in the form of Sunday morning, perhaps because he learned his lesson from how this thing went down, Tom played the same role in the production of VU and Nico. You know, just let the Velvets do their thing and let Andy Warhol say everything is marvelous, darling. You can tell the mothers and their merry band of fools had the time of their lives making this thing, and it's because Tom just let them do their thing. You know, because he was tripping balls the entire time. <laughs> Aside from the best of the pop moments and the best of the social commentary, the lyrics aren't always the strongest, but the music is always strong. This was a really talented group of guys bolstered by the Wrecking Crew. They shine on You Didn't Try to Call Me with those horn blasts. It's very reminiscent of what would happen with Forever Changes. Godly as us weirdos may hail O oh Holy Zappa to be, the guy wasn't infallible. When you take this big of a risk, the misses are pretty egregious and there are for sure some stinkers on Freak Out. Where the mothers miss the mark is when they're weird just for weird's sake. The weirdness works when it's held to the album's running themes. When it deviates, it gets bad. Help I'm a Rock had such amazing potential. Keep it to two movements, the middle and the end, and it might have been one of my favorites on the album. It Can't Happen Here is bone chilling. The rhythmic babbling is straight up disturbing. I would not want to hear this while high, and I mean that as the highest compliment. But the first movement kills it for me. It makes it repetitive, and not in the cool, fun, music, music is meditation, is meditation trance, trance is beautiful you. kind of way. Uh, in the way where I almost got up to check my disc wasn't skipping. We ventured a little too far off the course with that one. Freak Out really tested my patience Patience, man. I'm not sure Tom Wilson should have said yes to literally everything. The other great weakness of Freak Out, some of these songs are just way too similar. With stuff like Hungry Freak's Daddy and you're probably wondering why I'm here, uh, I get it. Those are the bookends of the first disc and should be somewhat similar in a concept album context. But the worst offenders lyrically are Go Cry and You Didn't Try to Call Me and musically the worst or you didn't try and wind blows. They have the same central motif. And to have those two back to back on the track listing just makes it even worse. So now I like wind blows better outside of the concept of the record. Did I say concept? I meant context. This thing has properly melted my brain. The pacing is weak. Things kind of fall off after the first side. It makes a soul inspired thing like how could I be such a fool or a bird's approximation. I'm not satisfied. Get lost in the shuffle. Those vocals are great and they could really shine with different sequencing. I feel like if these guys gave themselves more than four days to slam this thing out, they might have been able to develop some songs more, cut some, or maybe flesh out what they already had. That being said, as imperfect as Freak Out is, I had a time and a half listening to this. The cardinal sin of an album like this is for it to be boring and while it may have lost me at times, I was never bored. Frank Zappa was one of America's greatest exports, a national treasure, a confusing, nonsensical national treasure. If Freak Out's got anything going for it, it's that it's 100% original and masterfully composed. This is one hell of a debut album. The mothers aimed high and shot with a blindfold on. And that takes guts to do. 
you know, reactions of shock, disgust, contempt are all hallmarks of a watershed moment in rock and roll history. And like it or not, that's what Freak Out is. It's everything and the kitchen sink. It's got folk, pop, psych, R&B, doo-wop, blues, avant-garde, whatever the hell Monster Magnet is. And just about everything in between. It sometimes comes off as little feet wearing big shoes, but it's always intriguing. As unlistenable as it can be, it's a very important album. Forget raising the bar. This thing raised a bar that we didn't even know we had. I didn't even know it was there. Overall, I feel satisfied with having ventured into the deep end with this one. As a big ol' music nerd, I know how important constantly expanding your music taste is, especially when you do what I do. I feel this album has expanded my horizons. It's rewarding. I feel good about that. The fact that this thing remains so provocative and so challenging so many years later says something, right? Whether it's praise or punishment, Freak Out gets some kind of rise out of you. Freak Out scared me. I mean that in the best way. My personal favorites are Hungry Freak's Daddy, I Ain't Got No Heart, Go Cry on Someone Else's Shoulder, Any Way the Wind Blows, You're Probably Wondering Why I'm Here, and Monster Magnet. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays and Double Album Decembers, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it! That was me finally doing a Frank Zappa album. That was Freak Out by the Mothers of Invention. What do you think of this album? What do you think of Freak Out? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love and uh, occasionally albums I'm scared of. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet has to say, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11, and the third and final part of Double Album December will be posted next Friday. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week. Bye!